And uh, if you've ever seen this show at all or heard it before, if you have read anything I've written for Salon or anywhere else, you probably know I'm not Airbnb's biggest fan. I am not, in fact, uh, Big Tech's biggest fan. And uh, Airbnb has been uh, pretty active here in Washington, D.C. in ways that I would not consider entirely salutary to the Washington, D.C. community. And here to discuss that with us now is Lauren Windsor, our good friend. Lauren, among other things, is a spokesperson for Airbnb Watch. Airbnb Watch is the name of it, and uh, she is going to uh, let us know what they've been doing here with D.C. politics. So without further ado, oh, well, let me tell you a little bit more about Lauren. Lauren works for uh, Democracy Partners, which is a progressive consulting firm. She's a partner there. She has a, a political web show she's the executive producer of called The Undercurrent, and she is executive director of American Family Voices, which is a fine organization. So without now, without further ado, Lauren, thanks for coming back on the program. Thanks, RJ. So tell me, uh, what's going on with uh, DC and Airbnb? Well, we just had what was supposed to be um, the final vote. So we had a hearing uh, on Tuesday. Uh, they were supposed to have the final vote on the short-term rental ordinance for DC, and it was uh, delayed until November uh, because of uh, an impact report from the CFO. So, <clears throat> but here's what here's what I understand about the whole DC. Uh, Airbnb situation. Here's my read of it. There was a study that was done about a year ago, I think now, that said that there was so much Airbnb activity going on, and in fact, so many people acquire, buying properties up for uh, to rent them out on Airbnb that it was actually driving up the cost of housing for DC residents, for the people who live here, number one. And number two, that the city has been trying, or political elements within the city, have been trying to do something about it, get it under control, get it into reasonable balance with the needs of the people who live here, and that Airbnb has been active in what I would say is defending its own economic interests against those of the Washington, D.C. community. Certainly, is, yeah, certainly. Is, is that a fair summary? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's the same story that's played out in cities across the country, uh, in any major metropolitan city that has an affordable housing crisis. Um, you have, a, you know, an influx of short-term rentals, and it's not like the mom-and-pop sort of uh, story that Airbnb would like you to believe. Uh, um, a lot of the time, it's commercial operators that are using the platform to skirt regulations. Yeah, and a lot of people might say, <clears throat> well, you know, why not? You know, why, uh, doesn't it bring money in? Doesn't it, you know, isn't it good for the community? But I can think of good reasons why not, and I imagine you can too. Uh, there's many, many reasons. I mean, uh, you know, there's the quality of life issue of living next to a hotel. You're talking about uh, running businesses out of residential, residentially zoned buildings. Um, you know, it, it, people will often make the argument of the government can't tell me what to do with my property. I own this property and I should be able to rent it out to whomever I want. Well, your neighbor also bought their property and, you know, they have a right to enjoy that property without, you know, uh, living next to a, a de facto hotel. So you've got to consider the rights of all of the stakeholders in a community. And if you had everyone, it, the, the more people that are engaging in this business activity, uh, the more it infringes on the rights of other property owners. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge one. And I've talked to people in New York City, for example, who, you know, suddenly the apartment above them is being rented out to, you know, a dozen people at a time coming in and going and being awake all night and playing loud music. When I was living in uh, the Los Angeles area, one, the house just above me and behind me, which was a really much bigger house, became an Airbnb party rental. And it was a nightmare. It was mm -hmm. an absolute nightmare of 
blasting music all night and people screaming and cannonballing, cannonballing into the pool at four in the morning and renting it out for parties where people would be driving up our street at 70 miles an hour, a little narrow street with mm. kids playing and, you know, I mean, just like the worst possible. So there are a million different variations of that scenario. And then there is the question of, and we talked about how it makes housing more expensive by driving up costs. And then there's a question of regulation, or as we like to call them, protections, and uh, how that factors in too, right? Certainly. And, uh, you know, if you're a, a business advocate, I would think that you would want to see a, a level playing field. And really what Airbnb has done is to uh, be able to exploit an uneven playing field, and they want to keep it uneven. You know, they... they um, their, their hosts don't have to follow all the same regulations that other lodging businesses do. And it's one thing if you are talking about an individual that's renting out their own property where they live. It's another when you're talking about a host that is listing like 15, 20, 30 properties. I mean, you know, can, can we really say that at that point, you know, even if it's two or three properties, is that well, it, one of the rules that I've seen, and, and it's true now, I've moved from D.C. to uh, Montgomery County, and this is all being discussed and debated there because there are parts of the Montgomery County where it's a problem, too, including right next to me again, but, uh, but uh, uh, they're fanatically quiet because they know I will bust them without, you know, uh, a second thought. Um, but I guess, uh, you know, one of the rules that people talk about is, well, it's one thing if you're renting out a room in your house, right? I mean, you live there, it's your home, the neighbors are your neighbors. So most of the rules that I've seen that seem to me, but I'm interested in your thoughts, that seem to me reasonable are like, look, if you want to rent out your home, a room in your home and you're there, or part of your home and you're there, and it's not for more than you know, 30 days max, then maybe it's okay. But that's not what we're talking about here, right? So first of all, does that seem reasonable to you? And secondly, uh, you know, I know we're talking about a lot of people who don't fit that category at all, but does that seem reasonable to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, we totally support true home sharing. You know, if, if it's your uh, place of residence and you're, you know, uh, listing it on Airbnb, you know, it's one host, one home. And Brian Chesky, the CEO of, of Airbnb, has said in the past that he supports one host, one home uh, in cities that have housing constraints. I think anybody that lives in D.C. would, would tell you that uh, the city is facing a housing crisis. Yeah. And... Um I think there's no question about it. I think anyone who lives in Man and here's the thing. Okay, it's very nice that he says in cities that have a housing crisis, we support one house, one home. But if a city doesn't have a housing crisis, then people aren't going to Airbnb to go there. I mean, one of my initial, uh, I remember critiquing an economist named Tyler Cohen because he was saying Is that. Zero hedge guy. Uh, no, no, that's Tyler. He calls himself Tyler Durden. Oh. But uh, he, Tyler Cowan is... Oh, is, no, he's a Mercatus guy. And he's, he's like Tom Friedman's inspiration. It's a long story. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, he was saying Airbnb could be the salvation of struggling communities. So I was like, well, let's be honest. People are not going to Airbnb to, like, urban Milwaukee. They're just not going to do it. I mean, that's not where people go. And by and large, they go to San Francisco, they go to New York, they go to New Orleans, they go to Chicago, they go to Washington, D.C. We could name the cities that are popular with the Airbnb, and 90% of those cities have a housing crisis for the same reasons that Airbnb is popular there, it's because they're scenic, they're pretty, they have tourists, they have whatever, they have... So... Um, and I'm not dissing Milwaukee, by the way. I don't want to get hate mail from Milwaukee. I'm, I'm all about Milwaukee. I love my Milwaukee people. But, you know, the point is, I guess, that really the Airbnb business model, no matter how nobly they talk, I really think is about completely looking the other way as their users are commercializing and make residential areas, making it hard for the people who live there, because that improves their bottom line. Am I being too cynical? 
No, I mean, uh, you know, we've seen studies that have shown that you know, it's 40 to 60 percent of uh, Airbnb's revenue model is based off commercial operations. Um, it's hard to know because, you know, uh, Airbnb does not uh, is not transparent about its data. Uh, it's not transparent with cities that it has a tax sharing agreement or, or tax collection agreements with. Um, it's it operates from a standpoint of, you know, we will collect the taxes and remit them to you. And, uh, you know, those uh, agreements uh, are not public documents in most cases. So, you know, uh, when you're dealing with uh, government agencies, when uh, the operations between the agreements between uh, business and, and government to say that that those documents can't be public, you really have to wonder what's going on there because uh, if there weren't any problem with them, then, you know, they should be transparent. You know what, though, Lauren, and again, we're talking with Lauren Windsor about, uh, about Airbnb. You know what, actually, I don't wonder be, and you know why I don't have to wonder? Because I'm pretty sure I know what's going on. Maybe I'm a cynic, but you know, I was just down, I, I think, you, yeah, of course, you were there too, I think. I was just down in New Orleans a couple months ago for the Netroots Nation. Did, did you? Did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm not crazy, I thought I saw you there. And um, you know, what? The, what's happening to New Orleans, I, sp I went there early because I was playing with some musicians down there, we had to rehearse. So I went to like their houses and different places in New Orleans and what what it's hurting that city too a lot uh, maybe in different ways and but they're and different forces are at work but they're really ruining neighborhoods whole neighborhoods of of, of New Orleans so uh, you know I guess and again in the few minutes we have left okay so we talked about kind of the economics of what it's doing. We talked about how it ha damages communities. We talked about the lack of transparency. The last, I guess, is the political battle. And right now, a lot of cities, as you mentioned, are trying to bring it under control in certain ways. But it seemed to me like as, as that DC was in sense of my, a microcosm here. There aren't, aren't they really kind of blocking? Did this, uh, refresh my memory, did the city council actually vote to limit uh, Airbnb and are they blocking that in some way? Well, so what's going on right now in DC and, and this, this has been a stalemate for, I don't know, I guess like a, over a year, two years. Um, it's been, you know, really dragging out uh, with the process, but that's really to benefit Airbnb, you know, because any uh, amount that they can delay uh, an ordinance, that it's the longer that they can operate unregulated. And uh, this particular ordinance, I mean, you know, you had mentioned 30 days. Uh, this one has a cap of 90 days. Th this is one of the biggest sticking points in the ordinances, by the way, because um, what we've seen uh, with a break-even standpoint is that uh, really once you get uh, longer than 90 days with listing a property, it, it, it's more of an incentive for the property owner to just rent the the property out as a short-term rental and not uh, a long-term resident. So, so in other words, if you let it go past 90 days, then you're almost, uh, their incentive is to go Airbnb all year round rather than like find a tenant. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, so that's well, obviously- And it's don't... also harder to enforce. So what is Airbnb Watch? What does that do? So Airbnb Watch is a coalition of groups that are working on the issue. So you have, you know, obviously like the bigger players, like the union and the hotel uh, lobby, but then you have uh, people like uh, in Los Angeles, Lane, um, Keep Neighborhoods First, which are, uh, you know, big for affordable housing in the city, um, New York Communities for Change, Disability Power in Action. So, you know, there's with disability power in action, you know, why they would come into play is, you know, you have these lodging businesses that are operating without having to um, adhere to regulations to serve disabled people. Um, our organization, American Family Voices, uh, we've been around uh, for uh, like 20, uh, 2001, uh, uh, founded by Mike Lux, we've been uh, a strong voice on uh, economic issues affecting working middle class folks. We do a lot on Wall Street reform, which I think you referenced at the beginning of this interview. Um, but we see uh, issues of the sharing economy really having a, a distorting effect uh, on working folks. And uh, affordable housing is something that impacts all of us. 
Yeah, it definitely is. <clears throat> and I'm glad you mentioned unions, by the way, because the last piece of this is that the people who clean up or do other care for uh, Airbnb rentals are not by and large unionized, vast majority of them are not. So it's also a union busting move, yeah. isn't it? So uh, I love what you guys are doing on this. And uh, by the way, I don't think it's a, I hate the term sharing economy because nobody's sharing anything. It's a renting, it's, it's a rentier economy. It's just being, you know, that's more salesmanship from those guys. But you guys are doing great work on this. So I really appreciate it, Lauren Windsor. And where can people go to find out more about what you guys are doing? You can go to uh, AmericanFamilyVoices.org uh, to find out about, uh, you know, organizationally. If you want coalition-specific work, then that would be AirbnbWatch.com. Okay, great. And right now, for the purposes of this conversation, the hotel industry is my ally. Next week when I stay at a hotel and they charge me 12 bucks for a bowl of oatmeal, I'll be mad at them again. But this week, thanks to your good work, they're our allies. So uh, that's what coalition building is all about, right? You find people who, you know. who agree with you on an issue and you, you create an alliance. Saul Olinsky exactly. would be proud. So <laughs> Lauren Windsor, uh, thanks for the great work and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, RJ.